Okay. Um, so I'm Liz, and I'm mainly um, going to talk about um, uh, the usage of Rust for high-level applications. Uh, so first, a bit of um, uh, background on myself. So um, I'm Elizabeth Henry, aka Lizzie Kodagot, my pay name, because um, uh, I have a computer science background and I have a, a degree, but for a few years I haven't been actually uh, working in uh, computer science, and currently I am a, a semi-professional fantasy writer, so I write novels uh, in French, you might have guessed from my accent, uh, and I try to make some money from them. And um, when I discovered Rust, I was like, um, this is a really cool language, um, I was quite excited by it, but I did not have any project for like system prog systems programming, uh, and instead I, uh, well, I wanted to, make s to do something that was useful for me, and in my case, it, I ended up uh, quite re-implementing the wheel once again with yet another uh, markdown to PDF, HTML, and EPUB converter called the Chromebook. And at the time, I thought that it wasn't objectively a great idea to use Rust for this, and um, some high-level language would have been better. I mean, it was obviously a good idea because I was not being paid to do it, and it was fun, so it was great. But um, I felt like it would, I would have been more productive using something like Python, for example, or Java, or whatever. Uh, and I have um, quite revised my view now, uh, but um, yeah, that's mainly why I'm going to talk about uh, Rust for high-level applications. Just to be clear, what I mean by uh, high-level, I mean, can be, uh, I mainly mean applications where performance is not really a, an issue. So it can be command line interface, graphical user interface, games, but uh, probably not Firefox, probably not um, like the latest Tomb Raider or anything, because obviously performance are quite important. Um, memory safety, typically, uh, that's not really an issue because you would use a garbage collection in um, of a high level language. Um, you would typically use a of high level language such as uh, Java, C Sharp, Python, Ruby, or whatever. And security isn't really an issue either because most of the time it's an application that will be res run on a user personal computer. So you, they can um, hack the application to get access to their computer. That's not really a big problem. So we're not talking about a web server, for example, where security and safety can be, and performance too, are much more of an issue. Uh, and when you look at the pitch from Rust, at the uh, presentation, it doesn't quite fit uh, the description. Uh, and my first experience with Rust was something like this. Uh, and probably yours was a bit similar. I mean, I guess most of people in this room um, saw a bow checker error at least once. <coughs> uh, so before I want to talk about Rust, uh, just wanted to talk a bit um, about my experience with other language, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, because Rust is peaceful, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so my experience with um, other language, and as a disclaimer, I don't pretend to be a great programmer. I can be, what did I say, lazy, yeah. <laughs> I'm not a great designer. I don't come with uh, like the cleanest ideas at first. Uh, and I can sometimes take shortcuts, you know. Uh, I do something that works at this time, I put some comments like fix me, you know, and I never fix it. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I have quite a bit of um, Abaddon projects because uh, I have ideas and start wa working on them. I, actually, I have scientific data for this. <laughs> so yeah, usually I have a great cool idea. Uh, then I start writing code, that's exciting. Um, I mean, it's a bit complicated, but it's exciting. And then it works, so that's really cool. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, you realize there are bugs. And once you painfully um, fixed uh, the most um, uh, persistent bugs, you want to add a new feature. Uh, and this is typically at this point where I realize that adding a new feature like breaks everything in my uh, other part of my project. 
Uh, and at this point, I'm like, maybe I should just uh, rewrite it from scratch. Uh, but it's not very exciting to rewrite a project. I mean, it's exciting to start a new project, but to start a new project once you have already written it before, it's a bit not very interesting. <laughs> so yeah, I think my problems with many language and many imperative programming language is I think that make it very easy to start coding, but that also make very easy to do things the wrong way. And um, yeah, this, you can uh, often end up, um, if you're not very structural like me, um, I mean, if you, like me, you're not very structured, to be clearer. <laughs> um, you can end up with very complex code because you have some um, uh, variables that can be modified like everywhere in your code, and it's very like spaghetti coding. And the thing is, most of the tips I read from this is like, avoid this. Like, do, good programmers should not do that. They should have a clear design, but I don't find it very helpful because, uh, yeah, I mean, but if a language makes it um, really easier to you, to you to do something the wrong way and to just hide a, a comment with fix me later, uh, um, don't find it very useful. And also I think that um, a lot of approach from uh, high level language is to hide a lot of complexity. So that's great because it makes um, learning a new language easier. Uh, but for me, when you, you have a project that starts to grow a bit, I think that um, it, can make, it doesn't really make things simpler. Uh, this is a Python example. So you have a, um, a list, you assign it to A, then you say uh, uh, B equals A. You want to modify uh, B, but then you realize that A has also been modified. So at this point, uh, the language is hiding from you all things like references and all memory works, but you actually have to understand it at this point, and you have to understand that for example, the equal operator doesn't work quite the same way for integers than for lists, and, uh, and it can uh, lead to <laughs> errors that can be quite hard to detect because, um, yeah, I mean, you, you thought you were modifying, B, you, you weren't modifying some variable, you are actually modifying it. But, uh, so yeah, I think it's a bit, most of language, they do a great work to hide pain, but in my experience, sometimes hiding pain is not a great idea. To go back to the dentist metaphor, uh, some months ago, uh, I had some toothache. I did not want to go to the dentist because it's painful, it's not pleasant. So I took painkillers and uh, I go, went on with my life. Um, but then pain came back and it was, painkillers weren't enough and I had to go to the dentist in emergency and find the dentist in emergency. And while well, it ended up it ended up being far more painful and far more uh, expensive than if I had gone to the dentist uh, in the very first place. Uh, and rest really makes sure that you brush your teeth properly. And, uh, <coughs> because there are a lot of, I mean, I won't go into details about all of the cool features in Rust. There are a lot of checks at compile time. There's a great type system. Um, and more importantly, I think, um, is that libraries, um, I mean, it can be difficult sometimes to use a static type system, but libraries, they can, uh, I think most of the work relies on the um, library authors or the great authors, authors um, because, uh, yeah, it's a bit hard to make um, a library that is uh, easy to use, but for the user, uh, you're pretty sure at this point that uh, when it compiles, you're using it the right way, so, yeah, it can make things actually pretty nice for the uh, application developer because you're using the library and uh, ideally not uh, writing a lot of them. Uh, so in REST, uh, my very scientific data was, uh, the start was quite the same because it was before I coded, I had a cool idea. Uh, and then of course, <laughs> there is the board checking and it's not pleasant and it can be difficult and uh, yeah, Lust has quite, uh, uh, hard curve at the beginning, uh, and then finally getting code to compile can be a bit longer than uh, in um, other language. But the good thing is, when it compiles, uh, in my experience, 
there are really far few bugs uh, in Rust than uh, in most other language I was uh, used to. So at this point, this is like, oh, great. I mean, I had a really hard time getting it to compile, but uh, at this point, it's good. And when you want to add a new feature, uh, the compiler will make sure that you won't break everything in your p past code. And of course, when your project uh, grows a bit, uh, it's not a new project anymore. It's not, um, uh, there isn't the thrill of starting something new. But when you want to go, uh, in my experience, we first, if, when I want to go back to a project that uh, I haven't um, touched in a few months, uh, in many languages, it could be quite difficult because I like, things made sense when I wrote them, but now it's like some kind of mess. And we first, I'm like, okay, I can't quite understand things, so it works. And I'm, so <coughs> I found out that personally that Rust makes things, uh, yeah, design a bit less uh, confusing. <coughs> um, but the thing is, uh, I talked a bit about the type system, uh, and there are things like traits, there are uh, options which avoid um, uh, null, null pointers, for example. Uh, but they're not very specific to Rust. I mean, you could have this in other, uh, for example, garbage collector language. Uh, and what's really specific to Rust, I think, uh, is the borrow checker, because it's, um, I don't think it's something you see uh, in a lot of other languages. Maybe I think there are some research language that use some, something similar, but it's not a mainstream feature you see often. Um, and the bubble checker is really designed to make sure that you don't have low overhead for um, systems programming, so you don't have to have a garbage collection because it has a cost. But for high-level application, you would think that you don't really need these um, um, performances. So maybe, you know, it's, um, it's not really a feature, uh, an interesting feature, and it's more painful because you have to worry about the bubble checker. Um, and when I saw some discussions uh, about using Rust for high-level applications, uh, sometimes I saw people asking, like, maybe we should just put an um, arc of ref cell of T everywhere so we don't have to worry, to worry about the bubble checker. Uh, and some, uh, some people um, were like, yeah, but maybe, I mean, you can just say that Rust is a, I mean, if you, for you, Rust is just OCaml with a different syntax. Maybe you should just learn OCaml. Um, and I think that actually it's a, if, for me, I had this question that uh, is Rust like OK-ish to use for high-level application because it has a great type system and, you know, you can, um, uh, basically it's OK despite the board checker or is actually, uh, is it maybe because of the board checker that it, I found it uh, actually more interesting? Um, and um, when I first uh, learned Rust, a few, uh, something like two years ago, not um, <laughs> 10 years ago, obviously, uh, um, I saw this uh, conference by uh, Alex Quayton uh, where he explained um, what was the interest of a bow checker, and it quite convinced me that, yeah, the bow checker, it's, it can be a bit uh, obscure sometimes, but yeah, it's, uh, it has an interest. Uh, and basically, it, um, it, it tells, it ensures that uh, you can't have both aliasing and mutation at the same time, so you can either uh, have shared reference or mutable reference, but not both at the same time. Uh, and this is what ensures memory safety, and also um, it guarantees some kind of thread safety, at least data it avoids uh, data races, uh, like for free, because it's basically the same conditions. Uh, and I wonder, maybe this, uh, like, yeah, I mean, it's basically mixing the two. Uh, it's a bit the root of all evil. So maybe it's also the root of uh, having some obscure code. And maybe not mixing um, uh, aliasing and mutation also makes for having a more readable code and a code that is um, um, easier to reason about. Uh, so this is an example, for example, uh, in Python, um, where typically you, 
you, you have a variable a, you can display it, you can display its value, and you have some value. Uh, but then you can you call some uh, unrelated function or some uh, method on an unrelated variable. And the weird thing is that um, the value of A might have been modified because A could be an alias to uh, some va global variable or it could be an alias to some other object that you, you don't realize you are actually modifying it. So it can make things quite hard to reason and you basically have to know the details the details about um, every function or method you're calling. And in the rest, if you have the same code, you can be pretty sure that uh, the um, variable hasn't been modified because if you really want to modify it, you have to make things a bit more explicit, like uh, either, either having to pass uh, an person mute parameter so it makes quite clear that you're uh, mod modifying it, or even aliasing, you have to, um, uh, the board checker will make sure that you can't have, um, um, in this case, you have this um, bracket, curly bracket, uh, because uh, it has to go out of scope because you can go back to using A again. So you can't have something like, oh, I didn't realize that uh, 20 uh, lines upper in my code, I had some. Uh, um, late bar equals uh, ampersand mute a because uh, it wouldn't have compiled. And you can also have uh, things like, for example, cell, ref cell, or mutexes. Uh, but again, it is quite explicit when you use them. So you know that you, at this point here, maybe your variable will be modified by someone else. But um, in most of the case, you can be pretty sure that you can reason about your code locally and you. It's, it is explicit when it, um, it can be changed. Uh, so yeah, I think that the borrow checker, it um, doesn't just guarantee uh, memory safety and uh, data race safety, but also it makes sure that, yeah, when you, you're modifying a variable, uh, you're quite sure that you're not like um, uh, meddling where you shouldn't have been and um, you're not going to break everything because uh, if you can't have, um, like, um, uh, if you can't take, for example, uh, a mutable uh, reference and parameter, it's, um, it will be safe to, to call it. And the borrow checker will make sure that you won't have something like uh, uh, everyone is mutating everyone, some or something like that. Uh, and you can also be pretty sure when you're reading some code that if you uh, yeah, that there isn't some um, other part of your program that is modifying some variable behind your back. Um, and yeah, in my experience, bow checking uh, is quite of a big thing in Rust. Uh, but when you write a level application, the good thing is uh, most of the time the errors are pretty easy to fix. They're a bit annoying, but uh, a lot of them are hopefully going to go away uh, quite soon. I mean, for example, this vec.push or vec.len, uh, this is annoying that it doesn't compile, but I took this example from, uh, from uh, the RFC to actually fix the problem, and so uh, hopefully soon uh, ishly uh, it will compile and we won't have uh, this problem anymore. Um, and when you actually have a real problem with a power checker, and when you have to uh, redesign your code to refactor your code, um, it can be painful, but in my experience, again, it's writing application, maybe in libraries, uh, it can be a bit different. Uh, but most of the time, it's a sign that there was something wrong, actually, with my design. Um, and um, if I hadn't fixed this at this point and uh, taken the time to think about it a bit more, um, yeah, to step away from the... Uh, uh, the project and think about it, and things would have been mo much more difficult to fix uh, in, the, in, in some later time because uh, then you have to find where the bugs come from and things like that. Uh, and really, it is possible to go around the board checker. There, are, as I said, there are things like cells and ref cells, mutexes. There is even unsafe. I don't think you should use unsafe in some high level application, but for libraries, of course, it is different. Um, but the good thing is that 
when you, you use these um, types, you know that you probably shouldn't um, know what you're doing at this point, uh, which is great for me because it means also that most of the time, I don't really have to know what I'm doing, and the compiler will uh, have my bike and make sure I'm not uh, making things explode or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, an alternative uh, from, uh, to this, I think, is uh, functional programming, of course, uh, and I think it's great. Uh, it solves the problem of aliasing a mutation in a different way because there is, like, no mutation at all. Uh, and I think it's a great idea. It can be great for high-level application. My only problem with functional programming is uh, I found it quite hard to wrap my mind around it, uh, mainly because I'm used to uh, imperative programming. So, yeah, it wasn't uh, very... I don't know. I've, it's, I, quite, I, I feel like I really should uh, be enlightened and uh, understand it better, but... Yeah, I mean, it can be quite difficult sometimes. <coughs> uh, this is a picture I took from a blog post. When I was actually trying to search a um, monad example, and I ended up with that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think Rust has a very interesting position in the landscape of programming language because there is like imperative programming on the right side, and it's like open bar of mutation and aliasing. And, uh, Garbage collection, it uh, mitigates the problem, but it doesn't solve uh, really all issues, and you can still have very complex uh, um, spaghetti code. Uh, functional programming, I think it's a great way, but uh, it can be hard to... Personally, it didn't work that well for me. Um, and I think Rust is like in its own... Uh, I mean, I don't think there is... Uh, really comparable language to Rust actually, uh, currently. Um, but it's great because you, have, uh, you can still have some uh, aspect of imperative programming, but you have some safeties of functional programming, so I think it's really interesting. Uh, not just for systems programming, where obviously um, for systems programming, uh, it's all the more interesting because uh, you can't have garbage collection, which mitigates mo uh, some problems. So it's like, yeah, if you don't want uh, I mean, the alternatives can be very difficult. Um, but, um, yeah, Rust can be really interesting as well for non-systems programming or high-level application because it's, yeah, it's an alternative to... Um, yeah, I don't know if it's a new paradigm or something. It's like a very, I don't know, a pump... No, well, um, snub to say that, but whatever. <laughs> um, and the problem with Rust is it's like a short-term versus long-term uh, compromise. Uh, it's harder to learn at short-term. Uh, I think there are great benefits at long-term, but sometimes the problem is when, you, uh, when, when the compiler fixes a bug, you take a few minutes to fix it, you don't realize that maybe you could have spent uh, a few days or a few weeks maybe fighting the bugs in other programs, uh, programming language. Uh, and I guess you have to maybe have uh, stumbled on this first uh, in other language to really see the benefits uh, when you use Rust. Uh, and yeah, I think that uh, it's great because the compiler is grumpy for you, so you don't have to be. And it's pretty cool uh, to... I mean, you, the compiler has your back. It's, you don't have to worry about things too much. Uh, so to conclude, um, I don't... I think that Rust is not really, um, probably not the best target for total beginners because there are a lot of complex that can be hard to understand. And I think uh, if I uh, was teaching programming to somebody completely new to programming, I would probably go for Python, for example. But I quite hope I'm wrong on that people will tell me that they had great experiences uh, learning Rust as, a, as their first language, but um, I don't know, it seems quite uh, complicated still. Uh, and I think that for great programmers, Rust isn't really needed because great programmers, they don't use after free, they don't make these errors, they have great design, so, well, <laughs> obviously that's great. But for, like, mere mortals, I think, yeah, Rust can be a really interesting to make things easier in the long run and to have, um, in the long term, and to have the compiler have your back. And, um, yeah, well, the, 
fix your errors when you sometimes uh, uh, make some. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know if I have time for my like uh, Christmas list. I mean, after Christmas Carol, <laughs> but yeah, a lot of things were actually uh, being uh, discussed or RFCs have been accepted, so that's pretty cool. Uh, for um, pass for writing application, I guess the um, uh, ecosystem is quite important because if there is a library, it's really easier. If there isn't, it can be more complicated. Uh, it really depends on which application you're trying to write. So, but so in general, obviously, le Rust is a younger language than Java, Python, uh, C Sharp, or Ruby, or whatever. So there are less libraries, and you sometimes have to write a library. Uh, Personally, that's my personal list. Uh, I found I would love some uh, more internationalization uh, li crates on libraries. I had to write some kind of Akish crate to get my uh, program to be able to be translated uh, at runtime time between, uh, for example, French and English. Um, I think that uh, crates, the crates that I ecosystem is more focused on crates, obviously. Um, and there are some guidelines on how to write great crates and great libraries. I think uh, there are less for how to write application in Rust. And sometimes I was like, I don't know if it's a good idea, I still do it. And some people are like, no, that is, I mean, should you, for example, use cargo install um, to install, um, to, should you tell people to use cargo install to install your application? Uh, there was some debate, debate on this, and I think having some more clear guidelines on a, for um, application would be nice. And yeah, my personal uh, <laughs> like Christmas uh, wishes would be having some things where you can just push your code on some like Crates.io and publish your apps, and you don't have to worry about cross-compiling, packaging, or anything. This would be yeah, great, but don't know. <laughs> That's in, uh, and yeah, I, I also want to say, I feel a bit awkward saying this because everybody is like saying that, saying that the Rust community is great, but I mean, it's quite true, so I will say it again. Uh, I feel very honored to be able to speak in front of you today uh, because, well, I'm, as I said, I'm not a professional programmer, so it's uh, quite, uh, yeah, so thank you for being there. Thank you for Rust Fest for having me there, for the Rust community. Um, yeah, I <laughs> mean, this is the emotional part. Uh, and I think there are great things also to increase Rust reach, to make uh, Rust more accessible to people who are not um, professional programmers, who are not uh, um, elite programmers, but who might be a bit newer programming or might be new at systems programming. And I think it's really great. People who might be part of my marginalized groups or or we might have learned programming later in life, for example. So I think that's really cool. Uh, and yeah, so thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. The, this is my cat to reward you for listening to me. So thank you very much. I don't know if there is time for question. I mean, yeah. <laughs> We have time for one question. So who oh. is going to raise their hand first? Oh, right over there. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, um, such a question. Uh, how long did it take uh, for you to wrap around your head uh, around Borrow Checker? Um, well, I had learned C before, so it wasn't that hard. Most of the time, um, I knew things about how memory was supposed to work. So, uh, understanding, understanding the principle was uh, relatively easy, uh, but uh, then it's more like, um, it's one thing to understand the principle, it's another to realize that uh, what you think uh, is right might actually be wrong, or things like that, so... Um,
So the I question is when you get you? used to the borrow checker, basically. I guess a, f a few weeks or w one month, I guess, I would say, personally. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Lise. That's really great.